first two I think we should be um, we should be pretty happy with uh, standard use of product rule standard use of quotient rule um, I hope they are looking okay for you um, you can see by the way I hope you can see why you know how sometimes I'm like eh, the form you put it in not that big a deal particularly out of product rule but do you see why I wasn't happy to leave that do you see why She's just a teeny, it's just a teeny bit, it's a teeny bit ambiguous. Like, what is that? Is that sine of 2x squared? Like, is it sine x times 2x? Or is it sine of x times 2x? And even though I hope my brackets, for myself, that's what I was doing. Um, but I, I wasn't that happy with it. And I could take a factor out, so I did. Shh. Okay, now part three. Who agrees with my derivative? Hands up. Do you see what I did? You see what I did? Clearly, clearly this is trying to give you a curveball and think, oh, logs? Okay, I might write that as 2x minus 3 to the negative 1 and then launch into chain rule, which you should be able to do, but clearly that's less efficient than thinking, oh, log laws, log laws. Now, maybe had you seen this question first, it would have been a bit more obvious to you, hey, work with your primitive first before you get to the derivative because differentiation especially when you have to do chain rule or product rule or quotient rule is intense it's computationally intense simplifying is computationally easy that's kind of why it's called simplifying right so do that as much of that as you can first in this case that was use of log laws here to render it you know you don't need to use chain rule uh, really like proper proper chain, chain rule of chain rule um, you don't have to use it so much okay so you see how I got that uh, and then part four, of course you need to divide through, okay? You could render it back in the form that it was given to you, and I've given it as a fraction, but I don't think there's any need, any pressing need for that, okay? Here's my integral. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, actually. If you wanted to, you could take the third out and put the three in like <laughs> I did, but if you didn't, that's okay, so long as you landed in the right spot. Okay, now... Let's have a look at this contentious integral, yeah. Um, yep, so this is an extension one quiz, so I'm not going to worry about that. You're not going to get marked down for it, but you don't need to include that at all. Clearly, the crux of my proof is the graph, right? The graph is everything to me, okay? So really, most of my mental effort was invested in getting the graph right, and then the algebra ends up relatively trivial. Of course, there's another way through this, which doesn't require a graph at all. What would you do? You could, you could take this here, and because it's an inequality, you can't just multiply by 2x minus 1. Why not? Because 2x minus 1, being that x is a variable, 2x minus 1 is also a variable, it can change sign, so therefore it gives you cases. So to avoid that, you would multiply uh, both sides by... Whoa, I'm not highlighting, that's not what I want. Um, you would multiply both sides by 2x minus 1 squared. Okay, now when you do that, you have to be careful, right? Because doing so will eliminate the denominator from your question. That's kind of the point, right? But when you lose the denominator, you lose some information from the question. What do you lose? Yeah, you lose the fact that, wait, there's a discontinuity, right? So you turn um, this problem, you turn it into a quadratic, but there's a hole. Uh, and so that's why you can see right there. You shouldn't be at that boundary. And that's because the original function has that asymptote there, okay? Now, I, I, I mean, you've, you've heard me say this a lot, right? I clearly think that the um, graphical way is better. You've got to know how to graph these things. So let me just quickly, if you didn't choose that path, or maybe you chose it but something went wrong, let me walk you through mentally what I did to get that graph, okay? Let's start at the beginning. The easy things to see uh, that if you have a look at this denominator down here, that gives you the vertical asymptote right away. Okay, so there you go. I've popped him in. That's fine. When you then say, okay, I've got that asymptote. I know roughly speaking that this whole, uh, this whole rational function here should be a hyperbola of some kind because I've seen these all before, right? So therefore I say, look, I need to compare these two guys, right? I need to compare the leading terms of the numerator and the denominator. The degrees are the same. So then what do I do from there? I divide through, right? Because as x approaches the extremities, the positive, positive, and negative infinity, okay, you're going to get 4 million over 2 million, and 4 billion over 2 billion. So you're getting 4 over 2, and that's where my 
terribly scaled horizontal asymptote comes from. Okay, so there's that value. So now I've got my asymptotes and then I have to think about, well, is it going to be these two branches that I've got here or is it going to be, for instance, these two branches which I didn't draw? Now, what's a quick way that can help you work out it's the correct one, the one I've drawn, rather than the one in purple? Yeah. Um, the um, y-intercept. The y-intercept is really easy to find. Right? All you have to do is say x equals zero, right? which in this case happens to be very advantageous to you because that's an important point. You put in x equals zero, so these two terms that I was looking before disappear. So you've got negative three over negative one, and that's your point up there, which actually saves you a bit of effort. I did the working just to show that if um, it might not have been so convenient, you might not have gotten, ooh, x equals three. That's actually the boundary value I want. Maybe in more cases, the um, this intercept here, which tells you where the graph goes, that'll be some other value. In which case you've got to do this, right? Now I do think it's, it's uh, incumbent on you to say, I'm doing something different now, right? Because you have gone from here, whoops, to a line which, is a very different problem, right? It's related, obviously, but you're not solving the same thing. And lots of students don't demonstrate that they understand there's a distinction. So I tell you, I make it obvious, I'm doing something different now, I go ahead and solve, there's my boundary value. And then I say, look, from the graph, I wanna be below three. So they, you can see, I, I kind of stuck myself, I'm like, that on the scale, that's obviously not where y equals three should be. But I'd already drawn my y-intercept at that point, so I was like, ah. Eh. Whatever. It's just it's just to help me understand the shape of it. Okay. So I want this component over here because it's underneath. And then I don't even need to think about the rest. This entire component has to be part has to solve it because it's underneath three, right? So I just say uh, this is the part I got from the boundary value, and then this part, all of that is beneath two. So it must also satisfy. Okay. Are you happy with the way that I proceeded through with my logic? Okay. Um, graphing is powerful. Get comfortable with the graph for you. Not long to go now, okay? Right, should we move on to the last question? Okay, now just before we do this, um, I was just having a quick skim of the room before I um, closed it off. And I don't think, I mean, I didn't see everyone's, but I don't think I saw a single solution that was mine. And most people had different solutions. So there are many, many paths through this question. Um, I don't even know if the path I've got is the quickest one. I'd love to see if someone can, can beat the one that I've got. But this, I think, is pretty straightforward to me. You have to think very carefully before you put pen to paper, obviously, because you don't want to just go in some random direction and have all of this algebra written and equations written down. You're like, where am I going? Okay. So here is the shape they're after. Uh, S, L, M, P. So this is what we want to be a rhombus, okay? Now when you think about this, and admittedly, it's like, oh, it's been a while since I've done this. What's the quickest way, or what are some of the quick ways to prove that something is a rhombus? Yeah, it's it. Okay, so diagonals bisecting at right angles. Now just pause for a second. I would not be surprised if a, if a lot of you tried in that direction because, just think for a moment, what would it mean, how would I prove with coordinate geometry that the diagonals bisect and are at right angles? I need two pieces of information. Whoops. Oh, Let's try that again. Oh. Let me show it to you graphically, okay? If I want them to wake up. If I want them to, let's take them one at a time. Let's talk about them mutually bisecting. Okay, so here is one diagonal and here is the other. You could do a whole buttload of distances if you really wanted. But the faster way is to say, if the midpoint of one is the midpoint of the other, that means they mutually bisect. Thumbs up, okay? Then you need them to be not just mutually bisecting. If the diagonals bisect, what could it be? It could be, a, well, a rectangle is, yeah, it's not a, it's not a rhombus, is it? It's close, okay? Uh, it could be a square. A square's even better, though. So, therefore, I've got to go further, and I've got to show that, okay? No, because it could be one of these guys. So, uh, oh, that's terrible. Um, a kite has diagonals that bisect at right angles. Sorry, they intersect at right angles. There is one that bisects, you've got this guy, but the other one is not, yeah? So a kite is a squashed over rhombus. Uh, so what you need is both of those, and that's a good way to go, because midpoints, easy to calculate, 
Gradients, also pretty easy to calculate. So that's a good part through this question, okay? Um, yes, yeah, so and there's things that, give, that are given to you. Now, interestingly, when I looked at this, I noticed that I know where S and P are. Because I know where S and P are, M and L are also quite easy to find. Do you notice that? Because they're vertically beneath, right? So you don't have to do very much argument at all. You can just say, well, look at, let's have a look at M, right? Um, if you have a look at M, you can say, I know what its X coordinate is, because I just read it from that guy above, and it's on the directrix. So, bam, right? All, all I need to say, in fact, you can see, you can sort of see the way I've started the solution, okay? And in the same way, L is super easy, okay? It is the y-intercept of this line, that line there. So you just read off y equals mx plus b. That's going to be zero. Yep, okay. So knowing that I've got these points, okay, um, you would have had to get those to get your midpoints and so on. But if I've got those, and I also notice that these are vertical, I think I might be able to do this quicker. So I'd like you to do a comparison with me. I got my coordinates and I went this way, okay. I got the gradients rather than the gradients of my diagonals. I took the gradients of the two sides that weren't vertical. Okay, uh, I looked at. Ooh, there we go. Um, I looked at this side and this side. I found their gradients. Okay. The reason I went for them is because the other two sides, the ones I've marked in parallel lines for red, they're both vertical. That's part of the question. So no arguments required. So if I can get the orange part, right, that means this is already a parallelogram. And to get from a parallelogram to a rhombus is super, super easy. Parallelograms have two pairs of opposite sides. Two, they have opposite sides equal. So all you need to do is show that the pairs are also equal to each other. And look at this. Uh, if you have a look, right, the two adjacent sides that you want, uh, what they are, are, I'll mark it in green now, uh, this guy here, which is distance to the focus, and this guy here, which is the distance to the directrix, which by the locus definition of a parabola are equal. So I have a parallelogram that has adjacent sides equal, which means all of the sides are equal. So I have my rhombus.